allow me to introduce myself. <clears throat> I am Bishop Archduke Dr. Robert L. Maxwell of the Prophetic Royal Coat of Arms Ministry, Duke of Pomerania and Livonia, Colonel of the Prophetic a Colonel of the Royal Guard of Pomerania and Livonia, Field Marshal of the Prophetic Royal Coat of Arms Ministry, and Knight of the Sacred and Military Order of Merits of the Prophetic Royal Coat of Arms Ministry. And today we'll be looking at Part 2 of Joel, Chapter 2 of Joel. Joel. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you and ask you to empower us with the Holy Ghost. We listen to the apostolic and the prophetic. Grant us wisdom and knowledge concerning this subject. Make my preaching and teaching acceptable to you. Let this message minister to the hearts and minds of those who need to be ministered by this message. We ask this in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Joel 2 colon 1 dash 32 blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord cometh for it is nigh at hand to a day of darkness and of gloominess. A day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains. A great people and the strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. Three a fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them, for the appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen, so shall they run. Five like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire, that devoureth the stubble, as a strong people set in battle array. Six before their face the people shall be much pain. All faces shall gather blackness. Seven they shall run like mighty men, they shall climb the wall like men of war, and they shall march every one on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks. Eight neither shall one thrust another, they shall walk every one in his path, and when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. Nine they shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. Ten the earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark. And the stars shall withdraw their shining. Eleven and the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. For his camp is very great. For he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? Twelve therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning. Thirteen, and rend your heart, and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repent of him of the evil. Fourteen, who knoweth, if he will return and repent, and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering, and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Fifteen, blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly. Sixteen, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, and those that suck the breasts. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber, and the bride out of her closet. Seventeen, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heaven should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? Eighteen then will the Lord be jealous for his land, and pity his people. Nineteen, yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn, and wine, and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith and I will no more make your reproach among the heaven. 
20, but I will remove far off from you the northern army, and will drive him into all and barren and desolate, with his face toward the east sea, and his hinder part toward the utmost sea, and his stink shall come up, and his ill savor shall come up, because he hath done great things. 21, fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. 22, be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth her fruit. The fig tree and the vine yield their strength. 23. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. 24. And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the vets shall overflow with wine and oil. 25. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the cankerworm, and the caterpillar, and the palmy worm my great army which I sent among you. 26. And ye shall eat in plenty, and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, that hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. 27. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. 28. And it shall come to pass afterward, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. 29. And also upon the servants, and upon the handmaids in those days, will I pour out my spirit. 30. And I will shew wonders in the heavens, and in the earth, blood, and fire, and pillars of smoke. 31. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. 32. And it shall come to pass, that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Now that was out of the King James. But today I'll be expositing out of the NSB. Joel chapter 2, verse 1. Now, Joel chapter 2 is prophesying two specific periods of time. The first, in this chapter, the first specific period of time is the coming judgment that fell on the house of Judah in the Old Testament with right before the Babylonian captivity when the Medes the media uh, coming judgment of Judah in the Old Testament by Babylonian. Other period of time it's prophesying is the coming judgment that fell on Judah in 70 AD, the first three centuries, for their apostate wickedness. And then the other coming judgment is the last judgment, the great white throne judgment. That we all will stand before at the close of the millennium. First period time of judgment it's referring to is when Syria and 
Babylonian invaded that geographical location of, uh, again, and this judgment came against the house of Judah right before their 70 year Babylonian captivity and after their Babylonian captivity they would return back to the Holy Land and rebuilt the temple and were there until the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, the first three centuries, and then they were scattered throughout the world. This includes Kenites and un the unbelieving house of Judah. Verse 1, blow a trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm on my holy mountain that all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day the Lord is coming. Surely it is near. A trumpet here made of rams or bull, made of a, of a rams or bull horn. It was used to signal approach of danger. Its sound brought trembling from fear to the people. Zion here parallels to God's holy mountain is referred to Jerusalem as the capital of the nation. It says, be warned, you house, you apostate, Judah, For God is about to bring about punishment upon you for your disobedience, your wickedness, your sinfulness, your apostasy. Both periods of time, those in the Old Testament, right before the Babylonian captivity, and then afterwards in the first three centuries of destruction of the temple in 70 AD. In the coming judgment for you and I, the great white throne judgment those who do not believe in Jesus Christ who have not accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior are to be fearful of what is going to come about Verse 2, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness as the dawn is spread over the mountains. So there is a great and mighty people. There has never been anything like it, nor will there be again after it to the years of many generations. Day of darkness refers to darkness, day of darkness. Darkness is a common prophetic figure used of the day of the Lord and is 
generally a metaphor for distress and suffering. Dawn usually suggests relief from sorrow or gloom, gloom. The end of darkness. Here, however, it is used as bitter irony, describing the locust infection that spread across the land like the light of dawn, which first lights up the eastern horizon and then spreads across the whole countryside. God's telling <clears throat> Judah, the house of Judah, wake up because Babylonian and Caesarean is coming. My judgment is pending, pending. God today is telling if you have not accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior to repent, accept Him as Lord and Savior and turn to Him because if you don't and if you're not in Christ when that great white that day of the great white throne judgment it is not going to be very pleasant whatsoever for you and those who have apostatized or walked away from the faith God says wake up God says I give you warning wake up repent turn back to me and accept me as Lord Re repent and turn back to me and start serving me and living for me Are you living? Are you backsliding? Have you apostated, walked away from the faith for a while? Have you apostatized away from the faith and repent, turn to God and start living for Him and serving Him again? And the warning goes for that period of time in the first century when the Kenites took over the leadership and crucified Christ and refused to accept the long-awaited Messiah. It was some new that he was the Messiah, but they are more concerned with their traditions than God's truth. And then there were others during that time who apostatized, walked away from the faith. Turned back to types and shadows. Verse three. A fire consumes before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, but desolate wilderness behind them. Nothing at all escapes them. This is referring to the soldiers of Babylonian 
and Caesarea. Verse 2 through 11 is a character of the poetry is appropriate for imagery of war and that's what it is is poetry of the imagery of war before them Joel creates a specific Joel creates a special impact by using this phrase four times. Twice in verse 3rd, once in 6, verse 6, and once in verse 10, and behind them twice in verse 3, Eden. The garden before the fall. The Jordan Valley before the destruction of Sodom. All of which describes a desert that has become like Eden. Paradise, paradise, lost paradise, destroyed. That's exactly what happened to Judah. The temple of Solomon was destroyed. A geographical location was laid waste and went into captivity. Babylonian captivity for 70 years. And the same thing occurred for the second destruction of the second temple in 70. AD, the first three centuries. When Rome persecuted the Jews, and in their path left Judah a waste and then they were scattered the house of Judah throughout the world throughout the world and that's exactly what's going to happen to you friend if you're not in Christ your paradise is going to be destroyed when you find yourself standing before God Almighty at the great white throne judgment in the filthiness of your own righteousness. This paradise that you live in and belong to that you think it and dearly to you will be gone before you know it. And those who have apostatized, walked away from the faith for the rest of their life without repenting, who backslide, turn their back on God and stay in that condition of unrepentance. Have you, are you in a state of unrepentance? Have you walked away from the faith? God is saying to you, wake up.
first and you won't escape it either you will not escape the judgment Judah will not escape the judgment during that time Judah will not escape the judgment that happened in the first century and you and I will not escape the judgment of the great white throne judgment those who apostatize, walk away from the faith or who are not in Christ but we all still have to stand before the great white throne judgment verse 4 the appearance is like the appearance of horses like war horses so they run with a noise as chariots they leap on the top of the mountains like the crackling of flame of fire consuming and consuming the stubble like a mighty people range for battle the friends the Babylonian Empire and the Caesarian Empire that's exactly what they do they left they just literally ravaged that period of that period in that time and the Roman soldiers in the first century first three centuries ravaged that geographical location and left nothing but disaster And if you're not in Christ, or if you apostatize and walked away from the faith, on the day of the great white throne judgment, you will not have a leg to stand on. Verse 5, with the noise of chariots, they run. Wow. Okay. Mountains, though. Mountains, though barriers to ordinary horses and chariots, are not. A dear tyrant to locusts. Judah had a combination. House of Judah had a combination of famine, their crops and all that kind of stuff being destroyed with locusts and so on, and soldiers. That's how God used the nations and the natural natural disasters to bring about his judgment upon the apostate Judaism in the Old Testament right before the Babylonian captivity and the same went for the first three centuries during that judgment that fell upon the apostate Judaism and the Kenites and the unbelieving house of Judah and the Kenites were scattered throughout the world as we read in Deuteronomy verse 6 before them the people are in anguish all faces turn pale in anguish because of the famine 
that the locusts will cause starvation. And there was lots of starvation in the first three centuries for the apostate Judaism. My friend, if you're not in Christ, when the great white throne judgment comes, it will be nothing but English for you. Verse 7, they run like mighty men, they climb the walls like soldiers, and they each march in line, nor do they from their paths they do not crowd each other they march everyone in his path when they burst through the defenses they break and they do not break rank They are a very well organized military. Verse 9, they rush the city. They run on the wall. They climb into houses. They enter through windows like a thief. Climb into houses. As in the Egyptian plagues of locusts, the laced windows with no glass would not stop them. In other words, this Judd, in other words, my judgment is sure. And you will not stop the judgment he says to Judah. Judah. And God's no man, no human being, no philosophy, no ideology can stop God's great white throne judgment. Verse 10 before. Then the earth quakes, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon grow dark, the stars lose their brightness. Just as Isaiah saw the Assyrians and Jeremiah the Babylonians and the Lord's instruments, so Joel sees the locusts as the Lord's army, the army of the Lord with which he will come against his enemies in the day of the Lord. Earthquake, heavens tremble, go dark. Joel links God's judgment through the locusts into a cosmic phenomena of the day of the Lord. God's vindication.
Verse 11, the Lord utters his voice before his army. Surely his camp is very great, for strong is he who carries out his word. The day of the Lord is indeed great and very awesome. Who can endure it? Just as Isaiah saw Assyrian, Jeremiah, Babylonians as the Lord's instrument, so Joel sees the locusts as the Lord's army. Kezer, the Babylonian Empire, Assyrian Empire, God uses as an instrument of God's judgment against Judah during that time and in the first century Rome the Roman Empire as God's instrument of judgment upon the apostate Judaism destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD and the continuing campaigns of Rome against the apostate Judaism that God uses as an instrument to execute his judgment upon the apostate Judaism in the uh, first three centuries and the scattering of the house of Judah. God uses things in your life as punishment against your wickedness and sin against unbelievers against those backsliders he orchestrates events and things in your life to bring about his judgment in your his judgment to bring about repentance and conversion and salvation. And to the Christian, discipline. God uses discipline certain events, things, and so forth in their life to bring about the discipline of God's children, the spiritual seeds of Abraham, the called out ones, the ecclesia. Jesus being the very elect and the believers in the elect. Verse 11, this passage parallels. Utters his voice, a great, very awesome, two ideas often associated in the Old Testament. The term are frequently used to describe the day of the Lord, who can endure it. There is no escape. There is no escape except turning to God. Verse 13. <clears throat> Verse 12, I'm sorry. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning and rent your heart, not your garments. Now return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, bounding in, uh, and bounding in loving kindness and relenting of evil. Graciousness and abounding lovingness recalls the great 
self-characterization of God, which runs like a golden through the a golden thread through the Old Testament. But there is hope for Judah. There is hope for Judah. All Judah has to do is repent of their sins and turn to the Lord. All you have to do is repent of your sins. Those who backslide those who are unsaved and accept Christ as your Lord and Savior and the blessings of God will flow again in your life will flow in your life will flow in your life again verse 14 who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, even a grain offering and a drink offering. For the Lord is your God. Triumph. Trumpet. Not an alarm as verse 1, but a call of a religious assembly, a fast. So God is calling Judah to repent of their sins, turn to the Lord, and call a solemn assembly and go on a fast of weeping and mourning and re confessing their sins and their wickedness and their evil ways. And those who are backsliding, God says, repent of your sins, turn to me with weeping and crying. And then goes for the unsaved. All they have to do. And then you connect or reconnect the blessings of God flowing in your life. Verse 15, blow your trumpet, concentrate a fast, proclaim a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, the assembly, elders, gather the children and the nursing infants, and let the bridegroom come out of his room and the bride out of her bridal chamber. As with the call to mourning in chapter 1, no segment of the community was exempt. Congregation, the Hebrew for this word refers to a religious community. Elders, chambers. The place where the marriage was consummated be a turning point for you whether you walked away from the faith or never accepted there's always a turning point all you have to do is turn to God repent of your sins and connect yourself in the flow and the blessings of God and our Christian nations, Europe, Canada, America, Alaska, it's time for us as Christian nations to repent of our sins, confessing our sins, 
So there will be a churning point in our world today. America, Europe, Canada, Alaska. They need to they need to they need to turn back to God. Bring repentance. So that we may connect ourselves back into the blessings and flow, the blessings of God. Reconnect ourselves to the blessings of God. We've had nothing but atheism, communism, socialism, tree huggers, global warming, radical leftist liberals, destroying the moral fabric of our society, our Christian nations blessed by God. Verse 17, let the priest, the Lord's ministers, weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not make your inheritance a reproach. A byword among the nations, this being Gentiles, descendants of the sixth day creation. Why should they among the people say, where is their God? Your inheritance. Israel is God's special possession. Where is Israel today? The house of Israel? America, Alaska, Canada, Europe, England. That's where Israel is today, the house of Israel. And Judah. Judah is to plead not her innocent, but that God her, that God's honor is at stake before the world. Where is uh, byword? Where is there God? A radical question with a satiric intention. It says, if you turn to me in repentance, then the following will take place. Unfortunately, the tribes were scattered and they didn't hear and see God's call and 
many will not, right now, while listening to this message, will not heed God's call. Verse 18, Then the Lord will be jealous for his land, and will have pity on his people. The Lord will answer and say to his people, Behold, I'm going to send you grain, new wine, oil, and you will be satisfied in full with them, and I will never again make you a reproach among the nations. In other words, you repent of your sins, repent of your sins to me and turn back to me. Blessings will flow and I will reconnect you into the blessings of the Lord. You back, uh, backsliders, repent of your sins, turn back to the Lord and reconnect yourself back into the blessings and flow of the Lord. Joel begins a new section by turning from the destruction caused by the locusts to the blessings God will give to a repentant people. Zealous, the Lord will respond to the prayers of verse 17 and rouse himself to defend his honor and have pity on his people. Verse 20, But I will remove the northern army far from you, and I will drive it into a parched and desolate land, and its vanguard into the eastern sea, and its rear, rear guard into the western sea, and it shall stench, and its stench will rise, and its foul smell will come up for it has done great things. The northern armies, since enemies in the ancient times did not invade from the sea across the desert, Canaan's geographical location made her vulnerable only from the south, Egypt, and from the north, Assyria and Babylonian. Hordes of locusts are pictured here as vast from Israel's most feared enemies. Stench, because the locusts are now dead. Repent. Only if God's Christian nation to repent, Christian nation, repent of their sins, turn to God, connect themselves back in the flow and the blessings of God. When they do that, blessings will be flowing upon our world again, and God will defeat our enemies and protect us from our enemies. And if you repent, you backslider, turn to God, you'll repent. The blessings of God will flow in your life, and God will give you the ability to conquer your enemies. Verse 21, Do not fear, O land, rejoice and be glad. Verses 21 to 23, As there was threefold call to grief, there is a threefold call to joy. The land, 
the wild animals and the people are are called on to rejoice in the Lord's bounty. Do not fear, beast of the field, verse 22, for the pasture of the wilderness has turned green. The trees have bore its fruit, the figs, trees, the vine have yielded in fall. Early rain for your vindication. spiritual dryness of your <clears throat> life will be filled with the of the spiritual abundance of blessings from God in our life a rich harvest for your life Verse 23, uh, 23, so rejoice, O sons of Zion, be glad in the Lord your God, for he has given you the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for you the rain, the early and the latter rain, as before the threshing floor. And the vats will overflow with the new wines, oil. Then I will make up to you for you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten, the creeping locusts, the stripping locusts, and the locusts, my great armies which I sent among you, you will have plenty to eat and be satisfied. Praise the name of the Lord your God who has done, de has dealt wonderfully with you. Then my people will never be put to shame. Thus you will know that I am in the midst of Israel and I, and that I am the Lord your God and there is no other. And my people will never be put to shame. Dealt wond wondrously, God works wonders for the people when they were in Egypt, and now will work wonders in restoring the devastated land. Israel probably refers to all God's people, the whole, the house of Judah, and the house of Israel, with no distinction between the northern, northern or southern kingdoms also. I am the Lord your God. This clause recalls the covenant at Zion. There is no other. And through the systematic preaching and teaching of the Word of God, the world will be Christianized, ushered in a golden age of peace and prosperity. Paradise lost will become paradise restored, and the problem of sin and death will fully and finally be resolved. Twenty-eight through thirty-two it will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on mankind and your sons and daughters will prophesy your old men will dream dreams your 
and will see visions even on the male and female servants I will pour out my spirit in those days I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth blood fire columns of smoke the sun will turn into darkness and the moon into blood before the great awesome day of the Lord comes and it will come about that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be delivered for on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be those who escape as the Lord has said even among the survivors among the Lord calls and this awesome terrible day is referring to coming judgment that fell on Jerusalem, uh, the house of Judah during the Old Testament. First three, the coming judgment fell upon Jerusalem 70 AD. First three centuries and the great white throne judgment. After this, in the messianic period beyond the restoration just spoken of throughout the spirit, the messianic period of time begins in the first century in Christ's ascension to the throne and beginning his mediatorial millennial reign. That's when the messianic period the Messianic period begins in the first century <coughs> all will participate without regards to sex, age, or rank and then Moses' wish will be realized Peter extends all of these verses and uh, uh, verse, verse and uh, whosoever of verse 32 the Gentiles all who are far off who will not be excluded from the Spirit's outpouring and deliverance verse 30 to 31 these cosmetic events are often associated with the day of the Lord blood from war, fire, smoke, signs of God's presence, blood, the moon will become blood red, call on the name of the Lord, worship God and pray to Him, deliverance from the wrath of God's judgment as the Lord has said, perhaps Joel is recalling the Lord's covenant with David, of Joel chapter 2. Joel was still describing devastating effects of the locust plagues. This alarm shows the alarm showed that the crisis is at hand. However, Joel implies that the locust plagues would be only the forerunner of even greater events if people didn't turn from their sins. The Garden of Eden was Adam and Eve's first home, known for beauty. Here it used to describe the beauty of the land prior to the devastation. God told the people to turn to him while there was still time. Destruction would soon be upon them. Time is also running out for us because we don't know when our lives will end we should trust and obey God now while we can don't let any thing hold you back from turning to him deep remorse was often shown shown by tearing or rendering one's rending one's uh, 
clothes, but God didn't want an outward display of repentance without true inward repentance. Be sure your attitudes towards God is correct, not just your outward actions. Joel reaches at a turning point in his prophecy, moving from prophesying about the outpouring of God's judgment to prophesying about the outpouring of God's forgiveness and blessings, but this would come only if people began to live as God wanted wanted them to, giving up their sin, where there is repentance, there is hope. This section of the book feeds that hope. Without it, Joel's prophecy could bring only despair. The promise of forgiveness should have encouraged the people to repent. Joel foreshadows the invasion from the Armies of Assyria and Babylonian typified by the locusts. Joel contrasts the fear of God's judgment with the joy of God's intervention. On the day of the Lord, sin will judgment. Only God's forgiveness will bring rejoicing. Unless you repent, your sins will result in punishment. Let God intervene in your life. Then you will be able to rejoice in that day because you will have nothing to fear. Before there were, before there was fasting and plagues and before then were fasting plagues and funerals. Then there will be feasting and harvesting and songs of praise when God rules. His restoration will be complete in the meantime. We must remember that God does not promise that all his followers will be prosperous now. When God pardons, he restores our relationship with him. But this does not guarantee individual wealth. Instead, God promises to meet the deepest needs of those who love Him by loving us, forgiving us, and giving us purpose in life, and giving us caring Christian community. If the Jews, that being the house of Judah, would never again experience a disaster like this locust, never be put to shame, how do we explain the captivity, Babylonian, the Jewish slavery under the Greeks and the Roman Empire and their persecution under Hitler? It's important not to take these verses out of context. This is still part of the blessed blessings, sex, blessings, sections of Joel's prophecy. Only if the people truly repent would they avoid a disaster like the one Joel had described. God's blessings are promised only, the, only to those who sincerely and constantly follow Him. God does not promise that after the final day of judgment His people We'll never again experience this kind of we'll never experience this kind of disaster. Peter quotes this passage in Acts two, verses twenty-eight to thirty-two, Acts two, sixteen to twenty-one, the outpouring of the Spirit predicted by Joel occurring on Pentecost. While in the past the Spirit seemed Spirit seemed available to kings, prophets, and judges. Joel envisions a time when the Spirit would be available to every believer. Ezekiel also spoke of the outpouring of the Spirit. God's Spirit is available now to anyone who calls on the Lord. 
These wonders would give an hint of a or a picture of the coming events the day of the Lord views here as God's appointed time to judge the nation's judgment and mercy go hand in hand. Joel had said that the people repented the Lord would save them from judgment. In this day, judgment therefore and in this day of judgment. Therefore some will be saved and God's intention is not to destroy but to heal and save. However, we must accept this salvation or we will certainly perish with the unrepentant. Concludes chapter 2. Next week we'll work on chapter 3. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask you to hide these words in our hearts and minds. We ask this in hearts and minds and empower us to put into practice the truth. We ask in Jesus Christ's name. Empower the Holy Ghost. Amen. God bless.